to see you like a mighty Russian wind. We want to dwell under the shadow of your wing. We want to see you like a mighty Russian wind. Lord, we want to dwell under the shadow of your wing. God, we want to see you like a mighty rushing wind. We want to dwell under the shadow of your wing. Lord, we want to see you like a mighty rushing wind. Yeah. We want to dwell under the shadow of your wing. So blow, blow. Blow like a mighty wind, spirit of victory. Cover us with your wings, oh. Blow, blow, blow like a mighty wind, spirit of victory. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for bringing us into another Sunday. Thank you for guiding us through the week. As we start today, we hand over this meeting to the Holy Spirit. We ask that you take over in Jesus' name. We also ask that let every heart that will receive your word today, let your word impact their lives in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. So today we'll be looking at um, integrity. Last week, we touched on no compromise and integrity actually means we shouldn't compromise. So we have two tests today. We'll look at Second uh, Samuel 12, 2 to 4 and First Samuel 12, 2 to 4. Need somebody to help us read Second Samuel four twelve two to four. Two four. Thank you. Tattoo. But the poor man has nothing except one little hip lab lamp he had bought. He raised it, and it grew grew it with him and his children. It shared his food, uh, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arm. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the lab lamp that belonged to the poor man and prepare it for the one who had come to him. Praise the Lord. So we also read First Samuel 12, 2 to 4. First Samuel 12, 2 to 4. I can read it. Say, so your king is now your leader. So this is Samuel speaking to the Israelite when he was handing over to King Saul. So he said, your king is now your leader. I stand here before you, an old gray-haired man, and my sons serve you. I have served as your leader from the time I was a boy to this very day. Now testify against me in the presence of the Lord and before his anointed one. Whose ox or donkey have I stolen? Have I ever cheated any of you? Have I ever oppressed you? Have I ever taken a bribe or perverted justice? Tell me, and I will make right whatever I have done wrong. No, they replied. You have never cheated or oppressed us, and you have never taken even a single bribe. So when we compare the two tests, we read, we could see that they are 
completely opposite each other. The rich man who is acting here as David, so and based on the 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 what Nathan described to him, he, that is a completely a man who lack integrity. And compared to Samuel, who stood as a leader to the large crowd of people, the Israelites, and he could stand before them in confidence and he showed them that he had integrity. So from the so the memory verse we look into today is John 1 4, 17, 47. John 1 47. It says, so we'll read it together. John 1 47. It says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom no deceit. So that is in whom that has integrity. So when we look at the two verses and the text we read, we could see that integrity simply means somebody who stood for the truth of God, somebody who never perverted justice, someone who worked according to, who worked in the way of God. So when we see that in the two texts we read, one is a man of integrity, another one is a man who lack integrity. So and we also see that in Matthew 5, 14, Jesus Christ said that we are the light of the world, and the world means that it's a lamp on our feet. So and the Bible says that the, word of the, the entrance of the world giveth light. So, and he went further to say in Matthew 5, 16, so let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, that is, they may see your integrity before men, and they will give praise to God. So from there, we can easily say that integrity simply means the metric that, that measures our fear of God. It also measures our love for God, and how truthful we are in our relationship with both believers and unbelievers. And we could also see that integrity simply is somebody who is willing to tell the truth at all times, irrespective of the situation you find yourself, that you are able to stand for what God represents as a child of God. Because if we say that we are children of God, it means that we have the light of God in us, and if we have the light of God in us, then what should reflect from our attitude and behavior should be things of God. So we will look at two lessons here, two outline. The first one is the need for integrity. The need for integrity. That is, what does integrity mean? Why is integrity important for we as Christians? But the truth line is, without integrity, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the integrity, in a way, is, is, what, is what reflects the fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit produced in us. So is the integrity is what we use to show it forth to the world. And that is what we see in us. Like we see in the book of Acts in Antioch, the first place they mentioned Christian. So the people who nicknamed the, the, the disciples Christian because they see the attitude of Christ in them, they see the behavior of Christ in them, that's why they are able to call them Christian. So it means that integrity is the personality of Jesus that will reflect to the world, not just to the unbelievers, even to believers themselves. So the first thing we see here is that integrity, integrity is required in relationship. Like I said earlier, integrity is built over time, meaning you must always be trusted at all times. So if you say that you have integrity, you cannot tell the truth yesterday and lie today. You must be consistent. People will see you, must, they must be able to say, no, this person cannot do that, this person cannot say that, this one is a child of God. 
So from the lesson introduction, I said integrity is built, is, is being upright in character. A man of God said, charisma can take you to the top, but character will keep you up there. Integrity is to be honest, not telling lies, not cheating, but straightforward. It is sincerity, singleness of purpose, and being trustworthy. It is saying what you mean, not what you don't mean. It is standing by your word no matter what happens. Like we see in James 5, 12. Say, so let your yes be yes, and your no be no. So it means that whatever you say, people must be able to support. If you say something, people must be able to say that you, that is what you mean, not what you do not mean. So we also have a point that I said, we are in spiritual warfare, and nobody wants to go into war with people who have, who have chameleon character. That is people who have questionable attitude. Those are the people who lack <coughs> integrity. You do not want to, nobody wants to be associated, nobody wants to associate with them. You cannot trust them with anything. You cannot trust them with leadership position because you always question their attitude. You always question the words that comes out of their mouth. Even when they say the truth, you will doubt it because from their history, they are not consistent in telling the truth. God expects only people of integrity to be his representative in leadership. If we see in Exodus 21, when Jethro was advising Moses, when he told him that, no, you're putting too much pressure on yourself. So he advised Moses to select people who are honest, and who have fear of God. Those are the metrics of integrity. So when you see people who have integrity, you will see those attitude in them. You will see those traits in them because you will see that fear of God in them and they are consistent with it. And we also see in Act 6, when the disciples were trying to choose people who are going to take over the lead, some leadership position in some aspect, they said, they, they, so they, they, they select men who have, who, have, who, have, who are respected and full of the spirit and wisdom. That is integrity because you always, it's, it's, it's continuous and you have to make sure that the people who have those attitudes are people who are in leadership position and you trust them with the things of God. He said like integrity gives boldness, like we saw in the test in 1 Samuel 12, 2 to 4. Samuel was able to stand before the people because he, know, he knew that he has not done anything wrong. He has not cheated anyone. He knew that he had integrity. So because of that, it gives you boldness when you stand in front of people. It gives you confidence. You know that you have not done anything wrong, and that helps you when you are working with God because your conscience is clear. So one of the conditions to enter into the kingdom of God is integrity because except a man's righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is the attitude of the scribes and Pharisees? Simply means they do not practice what they preach. They, they teach people, they tell people what to do, but they themselves, they are not practicing it. That is a complete lack of integrity. It's a kingdom of heaven. Okay, integrity is a defense. Okay, before that, let's read Psalm 15, 1 to 4. Psalm 15, 1 to 4. He who works uprightly and works righteously and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, 
but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own heart and does not change. Praise the Lord. So we could see these Psalms describe exactly what the kind of man God described as someone who have integrity. And it means people that are like this are the ones who can stand in his presence, are the ones who, who, can, who, who he can speak for. Like he spoke concerning Job, that I, I can't remember the verse. He said, even though a man, even though Job, and, and, and uh, even though Job come here and is alive, as it, so he, he defend Job as a righteous man. So because God will always stand for our integrity. Like we also see here in Job 1 to 8, in Job 1, 8 to 10, when Satan presented himself before God, and God asked Satan, he said, have you seen, he asked Satan, he said, have you said, where have you coming from? He said, he's going through and fro of the head. He said, have you seen a man, Job? Is a man who fear God. And Job, and Satan said, he said, is it not because you have blessed him and built your hedge around him? So it means that integrity protects us. It's not just that it, it gives us like it makes us trustworthy with performing, even before God, it, it gives us that protection. It protects us even without us knowing it. Because Job does not even know there that God has been protected him. And Satan has been looking for a way to attack him. But because of his integrity, God was able to protect him. Also, I say integrity is a guide. That is, Integrity guides us in the right direction. It, it positions us in the path of God, in the direction that God wants us to, to follow. So it keeps us there. So we have have say, can people can somebody tell us some of the things that we need, the need for integrity? Any other thing why integrity is important for us as Christians. Hallelujah. Integrity is um, also very vital in the, um, among the believers, especially because of leadership. So I think one of the things that we need most all, all, all over the world now, not only in the Christian community, is good leadership. And we also know that we're in a people-pleasing culture. It's very difficult to say yes and stand on that when you know that you might lose if you don't agree to opposing or conflicting ideas. So for leadership, both in the circular and in the Christian community, and so that we can also teach the young generations that this is the way to go, no matter the consequences. We need to stand by what the standard of God is. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Does anyone have other things we can consider as a need for integrity? Any other one? Praise the Lord. So like our sister said, integrity is not just that useful for ourselves. It means for like our children, they watch what they do. For example, the best way that children learn is watching the elder ones, what the elder ones are doing. So if we lack integrity, it means that we are not teaching our children what is good. If you lie in the presence of your child, and the next day you are telling that child not to lie, so meaning that you, first of all, you are not even practicing what you preach and you are confusing the mind of that child. Praise the Lord. So what are the characters of a man of integrity? The first one we have here, I said the man of integrity teaches, like I said earlier, teaches and stands for absolute truth of the word of God at all times. Meaning that somebody who claims to have integrity, you stand for what God said continuously at all times. For, we could see example when Jesus was tempted. 
Sometimes we look at it that, oh, it's just Jesus. But we forgot to actually look at it that he was in human flesh. And he fasted for 30 days. At the time when this temptation comes, he was hungry. And he, he, like said last week, he did not compromise. He stood for what the word of God said. He quoted the scripture and he used the scripture to stand strong. Even when we look at what Satan presented to him, at what was going to give to him, it's, it's those are the things that most of us in this present time, we are looking for. And we work so hard for, from morning to night. But here, it was, it was, Satan was ready to give it to him for free of charge. But he stood for the word of God, and that is integrity. Somebody who also have integrity, they discharge their duty without fear or favor. God doesn't show partiality. If, as far as God is concerned, he's not a respecter of man, but meaning that he's a respecter of somebody who have integrity. So if we say we have integrity, we are not going to favor A over B. So we look at what does God stand for in order to make our judgment. So we make our judgment based on God's standard. You cannot separate the rich from the poor. You cannot separate those who you feel that they are in a better position or they can favor you in what you're looking for. So you, so you, you, you pass your judgment with the fear of God and without favoritism. So we'll read Acts 10.34. The book of Acts 10.34. Verse 34. Sorry. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, because their mentality before here was salvation is just for the Jew. But when he saw what God do, then God taught him with this lesson that look, I'll favor people who follow my instruction, who, who have the fear of God. So that is what God represents. He doesn't show partiality. He just loves what is good and whosoever follows his commandments. He said, he or she is ready to die for the truth and no situation will change him. The person who has integrity will die for the truth. So we look at Daniel 3, 6 to 18. So what happened here was the king Nebuchadnezzar that set up golden image and he wanted everyone to bow to worship that image. But here were these three Hebrew men, Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They've been taught not to bow to, golden, to any image. So at that point, when they hear the sound, the drum play, what happened? They didn't bow. They were the only one who stood among the crowd. And even with the punishments they were aware of that was going to come as a result of disobedience, they still stood for what God represents. That is integrity. They still stood for, 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 for what they believe as what God wants for them to do. That is integrity. That is exactly what God wants to, to handle things, irrespective of the situation that we might find ourselves. So it goes on to say that he or she will have integrity or the character of integrity. We look up to, we not look up to man for honor, but to God. We see example here when Abraham went to war, when he went to save Lot. And because he led the war, he was entitled to, to, to the goods that came from the war. But he refused to accept it only for those who went with him. Why? Because he wanted God only to honor him. He was not looking for honor because of the king or anybody would say 
that, oh, I have made Abraham rich. But he wanted honor to come from God. He looked up to God for honor, for whatsoever God wants to give to him. And we also have a say, it's not given to the flatters or exaggeration. If you say you have integrity, you will not look for the praise of men. You will not look for, oh, for what the positive things that are going to come from men. You will want God to put you on his own scale to judge you if you have done right or if you have done wrong. That is, you look up to God for, for, for honor and you look up to God for respect. You let God put you on his scale to see if you're on the right or on the wrong or what you need to improve on. It says somebody who has integrity will be solidly reliable, constant, and consistent. That is, you are reliable. You are consistent in it. You, it is continuous every day, every hour. So it, it means that, like we said earlier, you are not going to lie yesterday, tell the truth today. If you have integrity, you continue in that trait. You make sure that every daily, everything you do, is, it follows that God's instruction, which is integrity from God. So you do, you does, the person who has integrity does not handle the word of God deceitfully. It is very common today because you can use the word of God to say whatever you want to say. We have seen people who use the word of God for money purpose. We have used people who use the word of God that turn church to a place of where they do trading just for money. So they can quote the word of God, but that is not what the word of God is saying. You are not going to twist the word, but you allow the Holy Spirit to be the leadership and to pass instruction across. So somebody who has the integrity, you will not deceive people. Because if we look at Satan, the, the behavior of Satan was his, his, his personality is deceit. He deceived people. So if you are deceiving people, you are simply saying Satan is your father. Because the Bible says he's the father of all liars. So to deceive it simply means you are lying. And for your own, because of what you want to gain. So we also look at it that the meaning that if from there we can see people who have the false teaching. So you will not say because, oh, I want to do this, then you twist the word of God. So we have here that for people who lack integrity, what can we do? Well, what can they do to, to correct that? We, it's a question for the congregation. For people who have no respect for God, who have no fear of God, who lack integrity, what can they do to correct their measures in order to put themselves in the right path? Can someone help us? Hallelujah. Yeah, so um, I just, I'll just say that sometimes some people don't really know that um, that's their attitude, that that's the attitude that they are portraying. So I think if we identify that, first of all, we should remember them in our prayers and that, you know, the Holy Spirit will convict them and um, they'll be open-minded to learn, you know, the ways of God. Number two, uh, this is a bit challenging, but I think that we should also pray for wisdom to... Um, like give a feedback, a constructive feedback, like to correct them in love if we identify people like that. And um, some people will be, will be willing to, okay, to examine themselves and um, that could be a way of, you know, ministering to them to consider their ways and make amends. Praise God. Praise the Lord. That is, she's telling us that one of the ways is we put them in prayer first of all, we ask for wisdom, and we correct them in love. That is one of the ways. Another, any other way, we have two minutes. 
that we can help people who does not have integrity. Because simply somebody who lacks integrity is somebody who does not have the fruit of the Spirit in them. So how do we help people like that in the church especially? How do we help? Praise the Lord. Mike. Yeah, we can also encourage such people to get closer to God. When a person gets really close to God, like her sister said, praying for the person, God will open the eyes of that person to see himself as the word sees him. Yeah. So when the person is close to God and sees himself the way the word of God sees him, he or she will know, oh, I lack integrity yeah. and I need to change. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, man. Yeah, I will, I will use myself for example. Before I got married, I used to keep to myself. But over time, why? Because I thought I was patient or maybe I was cool, I don't get angry. Why? Because nobody else share my space with me. So when you're not happy in your space, then you start reacting. That is, God will begin to reveal to you that what you need to work on. So it's just like people say that when you've not put people in charge of money, that you cannot tell if they can steal or not. So it is when you have access to that, if you are able to resist the temptation, that is when you can say that, oh, you will have this fruit of the Spirit. So, going to the presence of God, because the Bible says our own righteousness is like a filthy rag before him. So, when we go to his presence, because of the righteousness of his presence, then that will be revealing our own unrighteousness. And Holy Spirit will be telling us, like mommy said, what we need to work on. It will tell you you need to work on hunger, then it will give you the grace to work on that hunger. It will tell you you need to work on whatever that you are facing, then it will help you. So the key solution here is the fellowship with God. Because fellowship with God is what brings up, is when Holy Spirit is able to reveal His fruit. And also, quickly, I will say that two cannot work together except they agree. So you yourself, you have to first of all agree to change and then release yourself to the Holy Spirit to be able to help you. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you today that you have spoken for your word. I will ask that every word we heard today will not stand against us on the days of judgment and you help us to change and improve in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, how many of us were blessed by that Sunday school? Integrity. And one thing that I'm taking out of that is integrity is not one of thing. It has to be consistent. You know, every time you should be a person that when you say something, people can trust you. You know, there are people that when they tell you something you will think twice before you obey before you believe it hallelujah because over time they've proven not to be a man of integrity i pray that god will help us to live up to that calling in jesus name the bible says that i was glad when they said unto me let us go to the house of the lord how many of you in that shoe, let's rise to our feet while we begin to appreciate God. The Bible says that we should come to his presence with thanksgiving. Let's go to his presence this morning. We're in the presence of the almighty God. You know, let's appreciate him. He's the God. He's the almighty one. He's the one that the 24 elders and the four living creatures in heaven, they bow down, they remove their crowns, they put them down and worship me. And that is the same God we are worshiping this morning, just giving thanks. I want you to take a reflection back over your life, even from January to this moment. Think of the goodness of God, what the Lord has done for you, and say, Lord, we just thank you. There are places that you cannot help yourself. There are situations that have happened in your life that is beyond you. 
but you are alive you are standing here because the lord has kept you why can't we just give glory to him why can't we just appreciate him for even where you cannot help yourself that he has helped you give thanks to his name worship him thank him for who he is he's the almighty god the bible says that the angels they say holy 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 that is god is pure the god almighty the powerful god and that is the god that we serve the bible says that they said he was he is and is to come that is our god is a permanent god it's always there it doesn't change go ahead and worship this god this morning worship god worship god even in this service the bible says that if i'm lifted up i will draw men unto myself we're in the house of the lord today people need salvation people need healings people need deliverance but when we pray when we lift god die god will do all this let's start by just appreciating it give glory to the name of the almighty god father we thank you lord we worship you thank you for all that you have done for us in jesus mighty name we pray in jesus mighty name we pray i want you to pray for yourself this morning even in this service in the book of genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 we know that scripture very well the bible says that in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth so god is the creator why did he create them when you go into the scripture the bible says that he created man for what for his glory and honor and power and that is why we are created so god created you and i to bring forth his glory and you are going to talk to god and say lord let my life bring glory to your name even in this service this morning lord let there be an encounter that will bring glory to your name through my life in the mighty name of jesus our life must not bring reproach to his name our life must not bring rebook to his name but must bring glory that is when we are walking in the fulfillment of the purpose by which god has created us just go ahead and say lord let my life fulfill the purpose by which you have created me by bringing glory to your name lord let my life bring glory to your name in jesus mighty name we pray in jesus mighty name we pray same book of genesis chapter one i read verse two verse two says that the earth was without form and void the earth was without form and is shapeless is formless and is empty void and any life that is void that is shapeless cannot bring glory to the name of the lord it's an unproductive land and that is why we're going to pray and say lord let my life bring glory to your name anything that represents shapelessness anything that represents form or void emptiness in my life lord speak your word into it this morning in this service lord speak your word to every emptiness in my life in the mighty name of jesus i want you to pray for yourself you know when you are in the presence of god oh just speak speak the word of god a closed mouth is a closed destiny you want to tell god that god visit me in this service oh speak your word to me in the mighty name of jesus i guess we need to read that scripture in jesus name we pray and i want you to ask for understanding may almighty god give us understanding even as we read through it in the mighty name of jesus you know he said the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep that means that it was not just empty it was not just formless but darkness was everywhere and when darkness was i mean where there is darkness that means that you cannot operate to the fullness of the purpose by which god has created you and that is why we're going to pray and do you know the next thing that god said god spoke to the situation and he said let there be and the whole thing started taking shape and you're going to say lord in this service this morning speak to my life 
let my light come lord in the mighty name of jesus lord bring meanings to my life in this service bring purpose in the mighty name of jesus every darkness will be removed in the mighty name of jesus speak the word of god lord speak your word to my life in the mighty name of jesus any area of my life that can be perceived as empty as formless oh lord speak your word to that situation tonight today in the mighty name of jesus in jesus mighty name we pray and the last prayer the last prayer point and i want you to pray this prayer point for yourself you know we we were told about the parable of the seed in the scripture and they planted the same seed but on different lands on different lands and the problem wasn't with the seed by the way it's the same seed the same seed that germinates in one land failed to germinate in another land why because of the because of the conditions of the lands so you are going to say lord prepare me for this service the lord prepare me for this service i don't want to live here empty-handed lord prepare me choir help me with this song God prepare me as sanctuary. Go ahead, sing. Pure and holy. Help God to prepare you in this service. Tell him, Lord, submit yourself to me. I said, Lord, please prepare me. Prepare me, O oh Lord. I'm ready. I release myself to you. Lord, have your way in my life. Lord, fill that emptiness in my life, Lord. Lord, I'm hungry for you. Lord, fill me up, oh Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, give me that water of life. Father, Lord, we submit ourselves into you. Lord, we ask that you have your way in our midst. We pray, Jesus, that this service today will be taken over by your Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, your words tell us that the things of the kingdom is not in the eloquence of speech but in the demonstration of the power of God. Lord, in this service this morning, let there be demonstration of your power and let every life be filled with your glory. And when we shall live here, Lord, let us look back and see your faithfulness in our midst and give glory to your name. Thank you, everlasting King of glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Happy Sunday. Let's rise up as we take the hymn together.
your name this morning because you are the almighty you are the alpha and omega there is none like you there is none before you there is none besides you you reign and you rule over the affairs of men from everlasting to everlasting thou alone art God from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same let the name of the Lord be magnified for power dominion authority belongs to our God yes Lord we bless you this morning yes, sweet Holy Spirit we invite you in our midst yes, Lord. there is none like you oh God Hallelujah. so beautiful to be in your presence Hallelujah. Lord we worship you yes, we, we worship. delight in your presence oh God yes, we do, Lord. nothing like your presence oh God you. fill this place with the fragrance of your presence yes, Lord. touch our hearts like never before as we worship we will return all the glory unto your holy name be exalted oh God Hallelujah.
Father, we want to see you in our midst this morning. We want to see you. We want to see your glory. Yes, Lord. We want to see your might. We want to see your yes, awesomeness. We want to see your majesty. Yes, Lord. Father, we can't count it all. We we'll begin to remember how you have been faithful. We we'll begin to remember how you have been good to us. How you rescued us. Thank you, Lord.
God. Lord, once again we've come before your throne of grace. Father, speak to us this morning. Let your glory be shed upon our lives. Jesus Christ prayed and said, Father, the glory that I had with you at the beginning manifest it. Father, we are asking this morning that the glory that you had for mankind when you first created Adam and Eve that you will restore that glory unto our lives in the name of Jesus thank you precious Lord in Jesus name we pray please let's be seated hallelujah this morning we want to share with ourselves in the next um, maybe 30 minutes on the topic assurance of glory assurance of glory and we're going to take a bible text from colossians chapter 1 we will take verses 13 to 22 and then 25 to 29 Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 22, then 25 to 29. If you really want to have a great understanding of whom you are in Christ Jesus, the book of Colossians is a very great book. You can take your time to really read it. It tells us whom we are in Christ Jesus and the power and our inheritance as Christians. So I read from verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. King James Version will say into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay, that's what we have there. Hallelujah. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of, his dear, of his, the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. I want to stress that's verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to him, himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, have made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled 
in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. I go to verse 25. Of which I became a minister according to the still worship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Hallelujah. Like I said earlier on, the topic is assurance of glory. The book of Colossians was written by Apostle Paul, and um, the Colossian brethren were having some challenges, and this was what prompted Paul to write this letter to the Colossians. Now, the Colossae happens to be on a path where a lot of people go through. I can say maybe in a, in a contemporary world, it was more like an international route where a lot of people pass through. And along the line, you know, in those days, people go by road, there was nothing like aeroplane. And along the line, a lot of culture settled in Colosse. A lot of different beliefs, different religions, diverse kind of people, they settled in Colosse. And along the line, the Christians were being affected by diverse culture. And this um, information came onto Paul and Paul taught it right to write a letter to the Colossians to tell them about the preeminence of Christ. Why Christ should be preeminent and not other things that they are being introduced to. So this was what made Paul to write this letter. And this is very, very essential in our days. Because, I mean, even on social media, the kind of culture you've never heard of before in your life, you see it on social media. The kind of Christianity that we never heard of, we see it on social media. And you, we have diverse and all kinds of people around. And because this has affected the church in Colossae, Paul wrote this letter to strengthen their belief in Jesus Christ. And the reason why he did this is because, brethren, our beliefs will affect our behavior, whether we know it or not. What you begin to hear over and over again, if it is not being purged by the word of God, it affects your behavior. That is why you see some people, the kind of dressing they never imagined they could ever wear. By virtue of where they live, by virtue of what they watch, before you know it, they begin to wear that kind of dressing. Why? They were being affected by what they have been seeing and what it doesn't matter. And that was why Paul saw that these people were actually losing Christ as their focus. And he now wrote that letter to them. One thing the Lord wants us to have understanding of is that we should make Christ the focus of every endeavor that we are in. And Paul went on to explain to them, after talking about making Christ the preeminent in their life, he now went on later on in verse 27. He said, let me read from 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations is now being revealed to his saints. And to us, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. There is a glory that God has in stock for every one of us. And he went on to say, this is the mystery. Christ in you is your hope of glory. That 
fact is the greatest mystery that he now began to explain to the brethren in Colossae. And that is what God is telling every one of us this morning. To tell us, brethren, that there is nothing that is as important as Christ. I tried to check up the meaning of that word preeminent. And it says preeminence means surpassing all others. Most of the time when we go for occasions, they introduce some people as eminent. Am I correct? I don't think I've ever heard anybody being introduced as a preeminent. They intro, oh, our eminent so, 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 and everybody, they recognize him. We know that eminent means well-known, respected, prominent. But when we're talking about Jesus, the Bible says he is what? Pre. Anytime we have the word pre, it means ahead of what we are talking about. So when we say pre eminent. He's saying Christ is what? Ahead of any other things that we see as eminent. Hallelujah. And that was what Paul was preaching to them and he's also telling us to make Christ the preeminent one in our lives. Why? Because when we make him the preeminent one in our life is the beginning of the manifestation of glory. Brethren, there is a glory that is in Christ. There is a glory that surpasses every glory of man. And God wants us to experience that glory. But we cannot until we make Christ preeminent in our lives. You know, why um, Pastor Deremi was taking the prayer meeting this morning, he kept on praying that the glory of God will be revealed in us. How many of us heard when we pray? I think we prayed it almost like three times. And I was just smiling. I said, thank you, Holy Spirit. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them in his image. They had a glory at the beginning with God. But they lost the glory. Sin made them to lose the glory. And that was why throughout the Old Testament, everything was pointing to a man that is coming to restore the glory. And when we got to the New Testament, he started to talk to us about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has come to do what? To deliver man from the power of sin. It was that sin that punctured the glory of God in the life of Adam and Eve, and it went on through everybody. However, when Jesus came, he came to restore that initial glory. And for as many of us that have accepted Jesus into our lives as our Lord and Savior, that glory has been restored. However, for it to manifest, you need to make him what? Pre. I'm waiting to hear. I want it to really sink. So that when, if there is anything you're taking home today, is, I need to make Christ preeminent in my life for my glory to burst forth. Hallelujah. Now, there was this man in the Bible. Like some of us, sometimes we think, can this glory really manifest? You know, I said the topic is assurance of glory. Can this glory really manifest? Maybe the Lord has told you, this is what I have called you to be. This is my calling. This is what I have created you to be. And you are wondering, can that really be? Is it possible? Am I capable? God is saying, I should let you know today, there is an assurance of his glory to manifest in your life for you to fulfill his purpose. So I want to quickly look at a man this morning that didn't see himself as a man that can carry the glory of God because of certain situation that happened to him. And that man is in the Old Testament and his name is called Moses. Most of the time, 
when we can if we can remember a man that physically had the glory all over him that men could not even withstand to look at him we will think of that man called Moses and that is why I want to use him as an example today to assure us that what we can experience the glory of God and not only experience it we can manifest it that everybody will see us and say wow this is the glory of God I used to have a friend blessed memory every time people see her they just get attracted to her not because of anything physical if you were to look at her physically as the world will look at people physically they will say there is nothing beautiful about her so to say but she had the glory of God upon her and people just you, you, it's so funny that people will be fighting to become her friend that is the glory of God so I want to look at the life of Moses I want to believe we know a lot about the life of Moses so I will just be jumping scripture to scripture we're going to look deeply into Exodus chapter 2 and Exodus uh, sorry Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4 so I'll just be picking some verses from it and then I won't stress you <laughs> hallelujah in Exodus chapter 3 from verse 1 the Bible says now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. If you look at Moses, if you go to the background story of Moses, Moses had a great privileged upbringing. He was raised in the courts of Pharaoh. He was one of the highly educated ones of his time. Probably that is why he was able to write the book of Genesis up to Deuteronomy. I want to believe probably he must have been sent to the university in the land of Egypt. You know, people believe Egypt is the cradle of education. He, he was really enlightened and educated. However, he realized the fact that he's an, he was an Israelite, and he revolted, he killed the Egyptian, and, and eventually he had to run out of the town or of the country. And he went to another country, the Median. And the Bible made us to understand along the line, he met a woman, he helped her, and the father in law decided to kind of adopt him. He married the daughter of that man. And he became a man that tends the flock. Now, you want to see where Moses is coming from. Most of the time, we don't really pay much attention to this. We don't see it as any big deal. But I tell you, it's a big deal. It's like you haven't gone through the university and landed in Canada, and they say you should be a shepherd. I mean, how will you feel? But Moses became a shepherd. God has a hand in it because God needed to train him because he was going to lead God's people. However, along the line, this must have definitely affected Moses. He must have kind of thought, oh, where I am, I'm a nobody. Let me just keep feeding this sheep until I have my own. Um, I'll just become a shepherd, take care of my children, take care of my wife. But as for now, the Bible even said it. He wasn't tending his own flock. <laughs> he was tending his father-in-law's flock. He wasn't working for himself. He was working for his father-in-law. So that was what happened to Moses. However, God had some plans for him. God wanted to show his glory in his life. So it happened that... God now told Moses, God met him, God told him, Moses, I want to use you. I want to show forth my glory in your life. I want to manifest myself through you. So let's go to, um, let's go to chapter 3, verse 12, where God started that. Verse 10, sorry, verse 10. Come now, therefore, 
God telling Moses, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses had already looked at himself as um, a nobody. I mean, we were told from the calculation of his age that he was probably there for 40 years. You can imagine. He left Egypt probably at age 40. He got to Midian, married the daughter of um, Jethro, worked for him for almost 40 years. That is more than enough to change a man's mindset and mind, a man's sex, I mean, mindset and psyche. 40 years working for your father-in-law, and then God now said, Moses, I want you to go and lead my children. God, what are you saying? I'm not capable. Ah, I'm not, oh God, I'm not. It's not possible. Who will notice me? Look at what he said. <laughs> Who am I that I should go, that I should bring the children of Israel out? Who am I? I'm a nobody. Peradventure, you're looking at yourself as a nobody. The Lord is telling you this morning and telling me, I'm going to manifest my glory in your life. Amen. I love the answer God gave Moses. Look at what God said in verse 12. So he said, I will certainly be with you. King James said, certainly I, the almighty God, I will be with you. The Bible says Christ in you is your only hope of glory. God was telling Moses, look, it is not about you. It is about me. Brethren, it is not about you. It is about me shining and glorifying you. Lest I forget, you know, when I was preparing for this, I was thinking, God, what is the meaning of glory? And God just gave me this word yesterday. He said, glory is the expression of God in a man. Hallelujah. That was the definition God gave me yesterday. Glory is the expression of God in a man. And God told Moses, Moses, I'm going to express myself through you. I don't know the excuse that you are having and thinking you will not accomplish the purpose for which God has created you. I don't know what you are thinking that makes you think, can God be glorified through me? God is saying, I will certainly be with you. It is not about you. It is about you yielding to me. The Moses gave another excuse. I'm trying to say this excuses because there are times when we think, I have more than enough excuse not to accomplish this task. You know? I was discussing with one of our sisters this morning, and I was telling her some things, and she said, Ah, God is able. God is able. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> now, the next one is in verse 13. The next excuse that Moses said Moses said to God, indeed, when I, verse 13, I'm reading from 13, Exodus 3. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say? Hallelujah. Mo Moses said, God, <laughs> we've heard of you from our father. Apparently, I've actually heard of you from my parents. I know you are the one that saved me when all the other children were being thrown into the Nile for crocodile to eat them up. I know you saved me. But you know something? That was the story my mom and my dad told me. We've heard a lot of what you did to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, even Joseph. I've heard a lot about it. But you know I don't know your name. You are sending me on an errand and they're going to ask me, what is your name? Then God now told him his name. Brethren, 
if you're confused about a situation, there's nothing wrong in you asking God to give you clarification. God wants to express his glory through you. And I assure you, through Christ Jesus, he will express his glory through you. In the name of Jesus. Verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. King James says, I am that I am. I can't change. Anything I have said that I will do, I will do it. It's like God was reminding Moses, I have told Abraham that his generation are going to be in, e in Egypt for 400 years, 30 years or 400 years. I have told him I'm going to bring them out. I am that same God that said that to Abraham. My name is I am that I am. I don't change. Whatever I have decided to do, I am going to do it. And that was what God told uh, Moses. Ah, God told him his name. I am that I am. And Moses also said, okay, what am I going to tell them? God told Moses what he was going to tell them. For every excuse that you have, if only you can go to God, he will give you the answer that will overcome that excuse, that will magnify his name, that will show forth his glory. The next question is in um, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. When you get home, you can read everything God told him that he should tell them. God told him, gather the elders. God gave him the tips on how to go about it. He gave him into detail in verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. Then the Lord now told him, was it in your hand? He said, it's the Lord. And God started showing him what he will do. What was God trying to tell Moses? Moses was saying, God, if they don't believe me, what will happen? God was telling him, don't worry. My power will be with you to make them to believe you. And that was what happened. When he got there, he told them, initially they were a bit hesitant. When they went to see Pharaoh, he dropped his rod. He became a snake. He swallowed the rods of the Egyptian, the snakes of the Egyptian, the, the rod turned snake. He swallowed them up. And gradually, they started believing. Another thing he did, so many plagues that God showed forth through Moses. Moses will say, okay, he takes the sand, you know, blew it into the air. What does it become? It becomes lice. There are times when Moses will just declare a thing and the, the water turned to blood. So many things. God's power was with Moses. But the very first thing he told him was what? I will certainly be with you. Brethren, Christ in you is your hope of glory. Then another one, in the, the same Exodus chapter 4, I go to verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh my God, <laughs> I'm not eloquent, neither before now does, nor since you've spoken to me. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And then God told him, who made your mouth? You think I do not know the weakness you have before I called you? I know your weakness. I know you are a stammerer. You will still remain that stammerer, but it doesn't stop me from doing what I want to do through you. That was what God told him. So whatever weakness you think you have is not an excuse for God not to showcase his glory. Don't see that as an excuse. God told him, I know you are a stammerer. I know you. I know your mouth. Who made your mouth? I know your tongue. I know the way you speak. But it's not going to stop me. That was what God told Moses. And he went on to say in verse 12, Go, 
and I will be with your mouth. This is the mouth that you are complaining about. I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what to say. He didn't stop at that. Moses still went on in verse 13. Oh my Lord, send by the hand of whoever else you may send. <laughs> ah, man, what was Moses saying? It was like, God, <laughs> ah, maybe you should think of somebody else. But God turned this question to another question. God say, said, okay, I think you need help. I will send you a helper. Who is Aaron? Is your brother. Mm-hmm. Very eloquent. Is your opposite. You cannot say much, but Aaron can talk. And that was why he was able to make the call for them on, in the wilderness. Aaron can talk, probably very eloquent. And God said, okay, Moses. Aaron will be your mouthpiece. Since you've been together in the family when you were young, he understands your language very well. Others may not understand you when you speak very well, but you grew up with Aaron. Can you see God? I remember when my children were growing up. You know, the very little one, sometimes you'll just be talking. I, I can't hear what he's saying. I will ask the senior brother, what is he saying? I remember then, the senior brother will say, ah, mommy, he said this, this, this. I say, hey, you can hear. Me, I can't hear. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That was the same situation with Moses and Aaron. Aaron understood and can understand whatever Moses says, even though he was stammery. He can finish up his sentence for him. God said, I'm going to give you a helper. And you see, the helper I'm going to give you is the kind of a helper that will understand your makeup. He's a kind of a helper that will not complain about your weakness. That is the kind of helper I'm giving you. Brethren, can you see how sweet this our God is? He knows us in total. And he knows that which he has created to boost us, to help us and be the booster that we need for his glory to manifest in our lives. And that was how God brought Aaron to Moses. And the rest, I believe we know the story. And then, let's see the conclusion of that Moses' story. In Exodus 14, verse 30, to 31 and also Exodus 34 um, Exodus 14 30 to 31 and Exodus 34 29 to 30 okay now let's see what Exodus 13 30 to 31 so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. This was the fear of Moses. Will they believe me? Can I do it? We can see the conclusion there. And then, to crown it up, when they were now going to the promised land, in Exodus 34, 29 to 30, the Bible says, Now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses came, oh, that, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. That is glory. That is what? Glory. How was this glory accomplished? It says... 
when he came down from the mount, he went on to say, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. It was because Moses was in the presence of God. Christ being in you, Christ being preeminent in your life, will rub off his glory upon you. It will rub off. Paradventure, you are not born again. You cannot express God's glory. Paradventure, you are born again, but you are living in sin. The glory has been punctured. So what are we supposed to do? God is telling us this morning, I want to express my glory through you. I want to beautify your life with my glory. I want men to meet you and say, wow, the glory of God is upon her. The glory of God is upon him. I'm not talking of physical things, brethren. I'm talking of the glory of God that when he's upon your life, no man can resist you. I'm talking of the glory of God that when he's upon your life, it will speak for you. I'm talking of the glory of God that when it is upon your life, it makes way for you. And that is the glory we're going to pray for this morning. Even as we begin to round up, I want to tell us, brethren, let Jesus be preeminent in your life. Let Jesus be. I want us to bow down this morning. Maybe you have not given your life to Jesus. I want you to talk to the Lord and say, Jesus, I surrender. I know I cannot experience glory without you. I surrender. I repent of my sins. I confess them. And I believe Jesus, your Lord, come into me. Come and experience, come and express yourself through me. Come and express yourself. And for those of us that are born again, that are saved already, I want us to talk to God this morning and say, Jesus, come and express God through me. Come and express yourself through me. I've learned today that glory is the expression of God in a man. Come and express yourself. I want your glory. It is your glory. Nothing else, nothing less. It, I want the glory of you, God, to shine upon my life. I want your glory to be upon me that anywhere I go, men will love to know you. In the name of Jesus. Father, we want to say thank you for this wonderful morning. You have assured us that if we come to you and we stay and abide in you, there is hope of glory. We ask this morning, Lord God Almighty, please come and express your glory through us. In the name of Jesus. If there is anything in our lives that has hindered this hitherto, Father, uproot it. In the name of Jesus. You did it for Paul. You uprooted every hindrance to him expressing your glory. And he became, oh, a mighty man in your hand. Father, Lord, cleanse us and express your glory through us. Thank you, precious Lord. Everything that we have been through that has been ministering to us negativity, that it is not possible, we cast them aside Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we say, Father, we believe you. As Moses went forth, that certainly you will be with him. We believe you and we are going forth this day. That certainly you will be with us and you will express yourself through us. Thank you, precious Lord. In Jesus' name, we'll pray. Amen. Let somebody shout hallelujah.
Praise the Lord. Let us join Pastor B to pray to God that as the word of God has been dished out to us, the word will not stand against any one of us in the name of Jesus. That the glory of God will be seen in us as never before in the name of Jesus. And in any way that we are making the glory of God not to shine forth, God will forgive us and will begin a new life to glorify God in the name of Jesus. And above all, all of us as a church will keep marching on and the gate of hell will not prevail. Thank you, Lord, because you've answered our prayers. For in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Before I go further, what's the definition of glory? I just expression of uh, what is the <laughs> what is the uh, glory? Praise the Lord is the expression of God in man. So I want you to see God expressing His glory in you, and so shall it be in Jesus' name. So this is the Amazing Grace uh, Assembly of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Calgary, where the grace of God is. So we would like to welcome those people worshipping with us in person and online for the very first time. Is anyone worshipping with us for the first time? Yes, I see you. <laughs> so let's welcome uh, to our uh, church. Of the Lord, you are welcome in the name of the Lord. We can see all over you the glory of the Lord. You are welcome in the name of the Lord. Yes, we love you. Yes, we love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, we love you. Yes, we love you with the love of the Lord. We can see all over you the glory of the Lord. Yes, we love you. We love you with the love of God and we appreciate you for joining us today. After service, Pastor would like to meet with you in person. Thank you for coming. Our weekly activities uh, is as follows. follows. Sunday, we have a Sunday school which starts by 10 a.m. Then the family service starts by 10.30 a.m. to 12 noon. On Friday, we have Bible study from 7 to 8 p.m. Then daily, we have a prayer meeting from 7 to 7.30. Then every last Friday of the month, between the hours of 10 p.m. and 12 o'clock, we have a vigil of the month. Then um, the vigil of this month will be coming up on February 25, 2022. All these weekly activities are held on the Zoom platform of the church. Please see the church WhatsApp for details. Then the women meeting holds every third Saturday of the month on the Zoom platform as well. The time is 4 to 5 p.m. The, uh, the meeting will be held this Saturday, that's February 18, 2022, at 4 p.m. and ends by 5 p.m. So as a virtuous woman in the house, please endeavor to be in attendance. Then donations to the church can be done through e-transfer at info at rccgaga.ca and also in person. So you can ask the ushers for envelopes to make your donation, donations while you're in church. So, and uh, like, um, we thank God for the new addition, addition. So that's why you see that Brother Michael is not here. The family of the Abibs, they've been, they've been blessed with a baby, with a baby. Uh, uh, the Lord will bless, and those that are expectant, the Lord will grant them that kind of uh, blessings that we all will be able to come before the Lord and give glory to God. So like Brother Michael will ask us to give, uh, to provide, uh, 
Okay. So the t I have just been told about the topic we'll be treating this Saturday at the women's meeting. It is how our children can obtain scholarship for higher institution. Praise the Lord. Don't say my children are not, uh, they are not there yet. They are very there. I remember when my children were like, uh, I'm not saying they have grown now, but at least. <laughs> so everyone should be, should partake in this topic. Before you know it, they are there. The Lord will help us all in Jesus' name. So we should not forget to give the, uh, the information required for, uh, is it? wedding anniversary for our birthdays or anything good that we can celebrate together and we should not forget to join the church on the, the zoom platform i mean youtube facebook and miss lr the church streams live the church activities at every point in time so please be encouraged to view this programs and as well the on miss l miss lr they say it's a radio uh -huh. So it's a radio. Go on and visit to know what it's all about. Then the fasting and prayer still continues. It ends March 1st, 2022. It's just we are so close to, to the end. The Lord will continue to bless each and every one of us in Jesus' name. That's the end of the announcements. We'd like to take our offering. Pray over the offering and uh, let's pray. In Jesus' name, we thank you, we bless you, Lord, for what you have given unto us out of them all, we are brought before you. Lord, we pray that you accept all our offerings in all forms in the name of Jesus. That, Lord, as many that have given God, you continually bless them in Jesus' name. For those that are looking unto you for one blessing or the other, God, we ask that you grant unto them all too in the name of Jesus. That we will all come rejoicing before you in the name of Jesus, that your glory will be on the, uh, on the rise and not decreasing in our lives in Jesus' name. And at all times, we will say the Lord is a good God in Jesus' name. For in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. For those of you that don't know, I'm Pastor Jan Daru. You met uh, last week, was it, Pastor Randy and Sharon Harriman? He's the uh, president of the, the uh, association. I'm the vice president. And they said they had a good time here, so I thought, well, I'd come and see what the good time is. And I didn't realize part of that good time was me coming up here, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, my background, um, the Lord has done an amazing things for my background. I was first, he saved me from a cult, Jehovah's Witnesses. And when I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that then meant uh, shunning and my family having nothing to do with uh, me at all. And, uh, but that's okay. Sometimes to do things for Jesus, that's the first lesson. Sometimes you lose everything so that you can be what God needs you to be. I've been um, the, I'm married for the first time for the wrong reasons, divorced, two kids, seven grandkids, remarried with a, a, a wonderful man um, who showed me the love of Christ. Sorry, I'm teary just because five months ago he went home to be with the Lord a shocker so Pastor Randy and Sharon they married Gary and I but they also buried Gary and I should have put that Kleenex in my pot uh, anyway I've got anyway tears that it is anyway through my life I've learned very thank you various things through those tough times like Moses there's been times in my life where I've lived circumstances 
because of my own making. But there are also times where, like Moses, you live your life because God's directing and ordering your steps and that he's there with you. So the, some of the things that I've learned in those steps is that you are going to go through hard times serving God. But the scripture tells me, us that that's to perfect us. And to perfect us, so just as our sister said, so that the glory of God can be seen through us. During those times, sometimes in my, your life, my life, you've held on to those hurts and those pains. During those, uh, my life, God has helped me not only through um, marriage, divorce, but I was also raped and sexually assaulted when I was in the cult and leaving it. And during this transition in my life of coming to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, there's some things that I learned. That healing comes through Jesus. But in order to get there, you first have to have the battle between your ears that you want to be healed. That you want to deal with that hurt and pain. Because sometimes you don't want to deal with it because it's so hurtful. You want to just leave it alone. But as long as you leave it alone and don't deal with it, the devil still wins. He's still taking and he's still winning. You have to get to a point in your life where you say, he's taken enough. Enough. And to give it to Jesus. Because that's what Jesus came for. To set the captive free. And sometimes the body of Christ... We've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but we're still captive because we're hanging on to all that hurt and all that pain. How many more stripes did Jesus need to take for you to let it go? I mean, he was, Scripture tells us, his own mother didn't recognize him. Let it go. And part of that letting go is to find forgiveness. Forgiveness of the people that have hurt you does not mean or make what they did right. It just means you forgive. Forgiveness is a gift from God to you so that you can go on and become who you've been designed and created by God to be. So you can go on and do the good works that he has planned for you. The hardest one might be or has been in my life had been to forgive myself. And that took some work. That took some work. I can now look in the mirror and look at myself and say I love myself. I thought of myself as the worst of sinners and God is so good. He's given that title or that worst of sinners to the Apostle Paul. That's what Paul claimed to be. He was the worst of sinners. But the point that God brought to my attention one day is if I, the Lord, your God, your creator, your maker, has forgiven you your sins, then who are you to hang on to them. Right? If God our maker has forgiven me, who am I to hang on to that hurt, that pain, and have unforgiveness of myself or others? So I encourage you, if you want the glory of God to shine through you like our sister mentioned, that you got a clean house and let go of things. And you can't hang on to it. One congregation, uh, you know, that healing is a choice. One congregation, we were doing a series on um, healing. And the pastor would do the sermon, and then we'd go into homes and do a uh, Bible study on that uh, message. 
And I somewhat shared kind of the same thing, that this healing is a choice. And yes, there's going to be tears. And yes, maybe not in the next two weeks, three weeks today, are you maybe going to have a miracle from God and it's all done and dealt with? You know, we know from reading scripture and in our own lives that God does do miracles. So it is possible that God may do that for you. But it might take a year or two to deal with things, to be all that, to let go and to heal. There, you know, there's a, a process of letting go. And uh, this one fellow, he was 75 years old at the time. A couple weeks in, a few weeks into the study, he did a testimony. And he let go of being raped when he was younger. 75-year-old man. Finally was able to let it go. And... God wants to help you. He wants you to get to the point to be all that he has designed and created you to be. And that's letting hurt, go of the hurt and the baggage and the garbage that Satan has dumped on your life. Or that, let's be honest, that sometimes we're uh, dealing with lots of garbage because of the circumstances we created ourselves. But God wants you to be all that you can be in him. So if somebody feels like, I encourage you today to leave it here with the Lord. And uh, have you know, your pastors pray for you before you go home. And to let it go. Let's just uh, take a moment and just pray. For the, pray for me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our Lord and Savior. We thank you for the life of Moses to know that we too as well are going through life where we have hardships and that's why he ended up being uh, a shepherd. But also how you can use those circumstances, Lord, to bring him back into the place where you, Father, are glorified, where your will is accomplished where your people are set free. And we ask, Father, that this coming week and the weeks to come, that you put on to the hearts of your people how you want to set your captives free. Put on to their hearts your desires and the plans that you have for their life. Make your will and your purpose, Father, our heart's desire. And anything in our hearts that doesn't line up with your will and purpose, Father, remove it from our heart's remembrance. Remove it from our remembrance. Guide us and direct us in all that we do, with all that we think, and all that we say, so that you, Father, and you alone are glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, okay. Uh... Please stand, I guess. It's been a long time since I've done this, so I'm going to fumble this, I think. <laughs> may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may his face shine upon you. Amen. Go in his peace, in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Jesus Christ, the Lord is God. Amen.